guys, welcome to Black Belt Breakdown. Today's episode is with Frank Rosenthal. He's a black belt under Henzo Gracie and is a member of the Danaher Death Squad. We go over his match with Ricky Lull from On It Nine. I'd like to thank On It for permission to use their footage of the match, um, and I'm sure everyone will enjoy this. This is one of the most detailed videos I think I will ever make. And it's one that I will watch over and over. I'm sure you will too. There may be a slight, slight issue with the audio, but if you turn your volume up, you'll hear it. There's loads and loads of quality, quality instruction in there. Enjoy. Cool. Okay. Let's go. So we have. We have Frank v. Ricky Lull. When was this, Frank? When was this, this match? This was, uh, I want to say, shit, uh, September of 2018. Okay. This is like right before, it was about a month or so before I got my black belt. Actually, it might have been like a few weeks before I got my black belt. This, I think this was my last match at Brown Belt. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I, I had seen, I knew Ricky because he fought a couple of teammates of mine. Um, you know, he competed against Ethan, he competed against Nikki, and I saw how well he did the ADCC trials. I knew he was really good. Um, so I remember going into this match, um, you know, uh, very aware of his front headlocks. I know he had a good guillotine. I know he had a good anaconda and dar strangle. Um, and so, um, you know, while I didn't want to focus too much on what he did, I, I did want to be aware of those things so that I didn't get, you know, put fucking unconscious because uh, that would have sucked. Um, and, uh, yeah, so here we go. So you'll notice in, in the beginning of this match um, – a constant battle for for inside position um of the legs my, yeah my my goal is always to use my feet and and you know put them in a position where obviously i can attack and off balance and i can't get leg locked um or uh or, or passed so you'll notice that there's this constant battle where i'm always placing my feet to the inside position of ricky's feet now what's interesting is that what he does really well is not only also fighting for that inside foot position, but his hand fighting really impressed me. Uh, and I think that was the first thing that I noticed. Um, you'll notice that when Ricky's on his feet, he's, he's looking to pass here, uh, you know, from the standing position, he's so active with his hands and feet. And he's always doing something with his hands and feet to make me react to it so that I can't just simply wrap around a leg and, and start to enter into Ashigarami and x Um And I was very impressed with his... Um, like right off the bat with his his just diligence and uh, and hand placement, like he's always tying up my hands, he's always pushing on my head, he's always um, disrupting me in some way so that I can't get into the rhythm that I want to get into. And so, you know, the first bit here is just, uh, you know, hand fighting. And uh, can we rewind for a sec? Yeah, of course. Um, how far? Uh, go back to just before I swept them. Okay. Here's great. Okay. So you'll notice that something something's about to happen here where go ahead, play it a little bit and I'll just tell you when to stop. Okay, I can go slower if you like. Okay. So from here, you see us battling for this inside foot position and right keep going. And right about here. Nope, sorry. Um what, so what's gonna happen he's got is the he head a, there. He does a good job of getting chest to chest, and he gets slight control of my head right here. Stop. Okay. Oh, it didn't. Okay. So, if we could go back, <coughs> excuse me, just a hair. Okay. So. So here. Uh, like right when he gets chest to chest. Right here. Okay, perfect. So what you're seeing now is uh, 
one of the most common battles you see in jiu-jitsu where Ricky does a good job of getting chest to chest and you'll notice that his right arm is starting to control my head. Yeah. Now, the whole battle here is for Ricky to control my head and shoulders and pin my two shoulders to the floor. If he can do a successful job of pinning my shoulders to the mat, that's where he becomes most dangerous in his ability to pass half guard. That's the most high percentage half guard passes come when you control your training partner or opponent's head and, and shoulders. What I'm doing is keeping disciplined inside positions. So you'll notice that my left hand has the inside position on his hip. My right hand has a, the inside position with a frame on his shoulder. And more importantly, oh, my lower body has inside position. What Ricky elected to do here is uh, – he was trying to pin me in half guard, but he picked his left knee up off the floor. And whenever the knee is off the floor, it affords me the ability to put a butterfly hook in. So mm -hmm. right now my left leg is to the inside because it was the leg in half guard. And my, now my right leg is also inside as a butterfly hook. And because I have all four limbs to the inside position, my left hand, my right hand, my left leg, and my right foot it allows me to displace his weight so what happens is as he goes to apply pressure to me i have the ability to lift him up and elevate him now he made a decision when i did that to capitulate down to a hip um presumably because he was you know worried about my ashigurami entrance so the moment he goes down to a hip I, you'll notice that i know if i just try to come up on top he'll just get back up to the feet and we'll just end up in the standing position so the only way to put somebody down as skilled and as good of a wrestler, especially as Ricky Rule, is you have to control both legs. If he has even one leg to base out on, he's going to find a way to stand back up because his base is so good and he's just so good at keeping top position. So you'll notice that when I see him go down to a hip, I make a concerted effort to not come up with one leg, but to always come up with both. That way, it ensures that I can solidify top position. So that's what you're about to see if you hit play. So, uh... so I begin the action of sweeping. He goes down to a hip, and you'll notice that I wrap up both legs. Yeah. And by wrapping up both legs, when he tries to flee the mat, I can solidify top position. Now from here, when I'm on top, I always like to operate with my right leg in the middle. Um, you know, for the reasons I just talked about, it prevents him from getting into any leg entanglement, and it lets me try to get my passing going. Um, and what I wish I had done a better job of here was staying on top. I think I was a much bigger threat to Ricky from the top position than I was underneath him. Um, not that I couldn't be effective underneath him. But I, I think if I could do this over again, I, I would have done a better job just now of staying head over head so he couldn't just stand back up and, and really believing in my passing a little bit more. Um, and you'll see that that's kind of a common theme throughout this match where I get on top and you kind of see like um, that that's a better opportunity for me because, you know, nothing against him, but I, I think he's better on top than he is on bottom. Uh, but I don't do a good enough job of keeping him in bottom position. And so now, again, you're seeing this battle for this, this inside real estate where now I'm using my right knee uh, in Z guard to keep him away from me. And I remember in this position saying to myself, okay, you can't let him surround your head in any way. Um, if he can completely control my head and surround my head, he, he might. that's going to be his best shot at passing or even worse, rolling into a guillotine or an anaconda like he's so good at. Um, and so I'm really doing a, trying to do a good job of keeping him at distance where uh, he can't control my head. And unfortunately, the trouble that comes with that, though, is that sometimes it's harder to get underneath people when you do mm -hmm. that. Um, so I'm still kind of in the feeling out process. Um, something else I noticed was just how strong his fucking grips were. Um, you know, we did this match at 145, and... You know, this is a guy my size, and I remember thinking, Jesus Christ, like, when he grabs you, he feels like he's 170. Wow. Um, and so, uh, you know, I wanted to be careful not to let him control my hands and wrists too much. Um, and again, we're now we're kind of in the Z guard, and it's just more of the same story. It's a constant battle for this inside position. Um, 
he looks like he's going for a lot of uh, long step passing, the, the backwards long step. Yeah, that, that's right. And and the key to the long step pass is that, you know, you have, again, like you have to control their head. When you're training in the gi, um, this can be done with an yeah, open back you know, just by grabbing the back of the gi. But we don't have a gi, so he has to do it with a heavy cross face, which I, I try not to allow him to get because um, it causes all these problems. You'll also notice that uh, he does such a good job of staying disciplined with his right elbow position and head position whenever I put him in Z-guard. And that makes it hard for me to enter any omoplata or triangle attacks. Um, so I'll go back just a sec. So here, right here is good. So now you see a, a bit of a different sweep. Uh, this is a knee lever sweep. Um, I'm going to wait until it goes forward a little more. Um, and you'll notice before, when, when he got chest to chest and half guard on, on the last sweep, good, stop right here, Paul. Mm -hmm. So when he got chest to chest on the, the previous sweep that I hit, he had one knee off the floor. Uh, and when that knee was off the floor, it allows me to put a butterfly hook in and threaten Ashiguramis and butterfly sweeps, stuff like that. Now he's playing a bit of a different position where he's looking to force half guard, but you'll notice that his left knee, which is on the other side of you know our bodies, uh, is on the floor. And whenever this is the case, we play a dilemma between uh, butterfly hooks and knee levers. So the idea is that if your knee is on the floor, I can't really fit in a butterfly hook. There's no space, but I can hit a knee lever and take you over in this case to my right hand side. If you pick your knee off the floor, well, now there's no knee lever, but now you afford me the space to put a butterfly hook in and go back to my Ashigurami game. So this is something that's drilled into us so much that Without even looking, I can feel and recognize that right now his knee is on the floor. So if you play the clip a little forward, you're going to see me hit a knee lever and take him over to my right-hand side. Now, what you'll also notice is that I didn't do a good job of controlling two legs on the way up. So he's able, I'm able to off-balance him, but I can't complete the sweep because I don't have control of that secondary leg. So right now, as he drives forward, you see me put my feet in position for a knee lever on the floor right here and take him over. Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't do a good job of controlling the legs, so it's it's just an off balance, but at least it got him uh, from solidifying chest to chest and really putting pressure on me where he could be effective. So you were saying a moment ago about his discipline with his head and elbow in the, the Z guard? Yeah. So you mean he's just keeping the elbow tucked in tight? Yeah, he always keeps his elbow like in the hip. And, and notice that he does a good job of framing. Like when when Ricky posts on you, he doesn't yeah. post a hand on you that can be taken off or attacked with Kimuras or anything like that. Look how he always makes a frame yeah. so that it's a, yeah. just a, a more solid structure that's harder to deal with. Um, and, and that makes it so much harder to go for things like arm drags or Udigatami or Kimura. Um, you know, he doesn't really make unforced errors as a grappler. Um, and, and so now it's my job on the bottom to start creating some off balances and, um, you know, put him out of position rather than count for him to just, you know, make a mistake and put himself out of position because, you know, he's, he's not going to do that um, on his own. Um, from this reverse Stanley Hiva position, he kept – doing a good job of controlling my wrist and other legs. So I, I felt like I couldn't invert underneath him. Um, again, if I could go back, uh, what I would probably would have done is I probably would have looked to stand up a little more and uh, change, just change the dynamic of the position um, because what I'm doing obviously isn't working incredibly effectively. Like it's not bad, but I'm also not, you know, I haven't yet gotten to the legs. I ha I've scored a, one sweep um but this might have been a good job to a good time rather to change tactics um so knowing what i know now that that's a switch i would have made right about at this point in the match <laughs> again he's always constantly controlling the head um and trying to drive forward to get chest to chest but the inside position of my feet and knees are going to make that hard now you'll notice that he picked his knee up off the floor, and so I put a right 
Uh, from here, I could put a right butterfly hook in. And now he puts the knee back down, so that gets taken away. The right, uh, I don't know if I do it on this one. Yeah, so there I did a little kipping escape to, to bail because I didn't like how, how that was going uh, and just looked to reset the position. <laughs> So there, he went straight into the sweep. Yep. Uh, let's go back a, a step. I think there's a slight delay on my screen from yours. Oh, sorry, okay, dude. So, yeah, so this is one of my favorite sequences. Uh, what, what you're about to see here um, is the idea of threatening the upper body to open the lower body. Um, so if you just go straight for somebody's lower body, uh, maybe a sweep like Simgayeshi or an Ashibrami entry, you're not really disguising anything. You're, you're being very clear about what you want to do and so they can defend it. So what you see here is I threaten an arm drag on Ricky's right arm. Um, now, if he doesn't respect the arm drag, obviously that creates back exposure and, and that's good for me and bad for him. So what he does is as I go for the arm drag, he pulls his arm away and that affords me to then get an underhook with my right hand and oh, put my butterfly hook in and threaten Sumidaiichi. So I start here with that. the idea of an arm drag, and then I use that to score the Sumagayashi and turn him over. That's really clever. So his, his base of support, if I'm sweeping him to the right-hand side of his body or my left-hand side, his base of support is going to be his right arm. But right now, his arm is occupied by this arm drag grip. If he were to base his arm out wide, then I could have gotten under for an Ashigurami, but he keeps it committed or rather I keep it controlled by that uh, my right hand, and so I take away his base of support effectively and I'm able to take him over, which was not easy to do because, again, his base was just so solid. And now you can see me working a little harder to maintain this top position and, uh, you know, try to get some leg pommeling going. Now, if we could pause it right here. Yep. Uh, sorry, we could go back a little bit. <laughs> like right when I get uh, my, my right knee inside. Good, here's perfect. Okay. Okay, so what I what I aim to do from here, a big part of my game is, is to pommel the legs. Uh, and this is something I, I like to do and I, I think I do pretty well. Um, the problem is, is that I have no upper body grips and no head position on Ricky to start the action of leg pommel. What Ricky's doing is doing a good job of keeping his right knee, which you can see right by my sternum, to the inside and always pushing me back and pushing me away. So because his right leg is pushing me away, it makes it hard for me to bring my head over the height of his head, where it needs to be to effectively keep him on his back and start pommeling my legs. He also does a good job of keeping his elbows in tight. So he doesn't afford me any ability to get a right-handed underhook or a left-handed underhook or even a cross face. So because there's a lack of connection between my upper body and his upper body, I can't get an underhook, I can't get a cross face, and there's a lack of head position, meaning I can't get my head uh, past the height of his head, it creates this inability to get my leg pommeling going. Um, and he does a good job of pushing me away and then using that to stand back up. So what I would have done differently here is I probably would have gone to more of a pressure passing position, maybe like a body lock or, um, you know, trying to force half guard and, and try to pass him low rather than uh, this straight hamstring pin, which I couldn't get going because of the lack of head position and underhooks. So if you play the video, you'll see he does a good job of like pushing me away. Yeah, and he's straight up, isn't he? And I can't stay head over head for too long. And he stands back up and I'm like, ah, fuck. Like this is getting frustrating now because you work so hard to put a guy, uh, to sweep a guy and put him on his back. But 
I didn't have the skills really from the top position to really keep somebody down. Um, you know, that's something I feel I have much better now. But again, this match is almost, you know, two years ago at this point. And uh, it's funny, when you go back and watch matches, even that you win, you're like, man, I fucking suck. <laughs> you know, there's just so many things, like, that maybe even I knew, but I just, did, you know, didn't execute uh, at the time. But uh, It's the beauty of experience, though. That's right. That's right. So here we are back to, you know, hand fighting and, and battling for this inside foot position. And again, um, you know, a better idea for me at this point, I try to drag there, but kind of pulled out. Now, uh, pause right here. Hopefully we can go back a, a step. So. Yeah, perfect. Uh, okay, just back a little bit, sorry. Okay, so to where the inversion is, or yeah, yeah, right where the inversion is. Okay, I'm pretty much just going back to all the points that I'm like, hey, you guys, here's where I fucked up because I suck. Okay, so you'll notice that um, I'm starting to invert for a cross ashi entry, uh, and I'm trying to do so with a scoop grip using my uh, I think it's going to be my left arm, right? Yeah, it is. It's the left here. arm, just under yeah, his leg. Right there. here. Yeah. So I'm trying to use this scoop grip, and uh, what Ricky does is he does a good job of keeping his hips back and away from me. So had he kept driving forward, I probably would have been able to get underneath him and uh, and pull into the legs. But because he keeps his back far and away, it kind of kills any entry that I had. Um, and so what would have been a better thing for me at this point would be to maybe think about inverting all the way through and starting to attack the upper body with a triangle kind of like how ryan hall used mm -hmm. to do back in the day yeah. um, ryan was so good at pulling into 50 50 that when he would get in this position guys would bring their legs back and away from him because they didn't want him to put them in 50 50 and then he would switch and attack the upper body with triangles by spinning through and that might not have been a bad idea in this position if I could thread uh, my foot under the armpit and look to attack with a triangle. But uh, again, I didn't do that because, um, you know, I'm an idiot. <laughs> right. <clears throat> okay, so here, you know, I make a slight attempt at trying to pull the arm through, but again, he just... Uh, kind of brings everything back to a good position. And this arm surrounding my hip, you'll notice Ricky's left arm surrounding my hip, was really a pain in the ass, man, because it, it really stops you from hip escaping away uh, and creating space and the movement that you want to. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can keep going. This is a key part of the match, I think. Yeah. So right now, good. Stop. Yeah. Uh, if we could go back a little bit to where he gets the heel hook. So let's just go back slightly. Perfect. So you'll notice here, he falls back for a leg lock, which, to be honest, I was pretty surprised about. Um, you know, he didn't go for any leg locks the entire match, and I, I thought maybe it's my ego. I thought maybe it's because he didn't want to get in a leg entanglement with me. Um, but as soon as I felt him put this Ashigurami on and dig my heel, I was like, man, like, this guy knows how to finish a heel hook. Um, like, you know, he... He will absolutely break your shit off if you give him the chance. And so he gets a pretty good bite on my heel. Um, and what I normally do is I would have stayed on my butt and looked to re-pommel my left leg inside and look to counter leg lock. Mm -hmm. and, and normally I would so have the outside ashy. Yeah. On his, yeah. Um, and normally I would be, you know, thrilled to to have that conversation. Uh, but he had such a bite on my heel that I was like, I don't want to risk like getting broken here because it was kind of starting to get tight 
And so what I do is I stand up and I address his left foot by getting it off my hip because I don't want to allow him to reap his left foot across my, my legs um, and turn this into an even tighter position. So breaking the connection before it even happens. Yeah, or, or as it's happening. Like, mm -hmm. So if he gets to outside Ashigurami and his feet are joined together, man, like that's a much harder structure to break apart. You know, because it's a wedge that's reinforced. It's one leg reinforcing the other leg, wedging your hip in place. Right now, he's in a standard ashigrami or single leg X, as people call it. And so, uh, while it's tight, it's not nearly as difficult to separate as, say, an outside ashi or a saddle or an inside ashi, something like that. So, before he gets any further, you see my right hand is going to address his foot. And uh, I look to stand up so that I can better deal with it. So there it is, dealing with the foot. So he, he takes a good rip at it. And uh, again, because I keep his feet separated, that's what stops me from getting broken. Now I look to back step here, and I just return back to seated only because I knew that at this point there was like very, very little time left. And now I'm, I'm already starting to think about okay, mentally prepare yourself for overtime. So in these situations, you have to, obviously you always want to fight from beginning to end. You always want to be looking to finish from the beginning of the match to the end of the match. But at this point, there's 20 seconds left, okay? And if I haven't submitted him in, you know, nine minutes and 40 seconds, um, the reality is you're probably not going to submit him in the last 20 seconds. So here you're going to see me, you know, protect myself, um, keep inside position and, and just kind of catch my breath and mentally start to get ready for overtime, which we're probably going to go into, you know, knowing that there's so little time left. And I just wanted to know, like, what's interesting about overtime and where my mind was at it, at this point in the match was no matter what happened in regulation, when regulation's over, it's fucking over. Yeah. It doesn't matter anymore. So, uh, yeah, we can pause it here. So, like, in a match like this, like, I feel like I did I did okay in regulation. You know, I didn't, it's not like I got my guard cast or anything. I scored a couple sweeps. Um, you know, he had a good leg attack. So, it, it was a competitive match. But regardless of me having small successes, like sweeping him a couple times, or even small failures of him getting into my legs, none of that matters when you go into overtime. You can't be excited that you did well in regulation. You also can't be down on yourself if you got beat up in regulation mm -hmm. because it doesn't fucking matter anymore. It's almost like you're going into a completely separate match. It's mm -hmm. a new event altogether. And so what I try to do is when overtime starts, um, I don't think about what just happened. I only think about what's happening right now. So um, – I'm on defense first. I knew, obviously, most people choose the back. And um, my initial thought when dealing with the back when I'm on defense is, number one, make sure that we have our hands in the right place and we get the most optimal starting position. Um, for me, what that means is that I'm going to have a primary defensive hand and a secondary defensive hand and not let him start to um, start with his hands too high up on my chest which is going to be a, obviously a big advantage for him. Um, and then we think about off the whistle or off the go, creating misalignment between our hips. What I can't allow is for our spines to be aligned like so, where he can look to lock body triangles and, and you know squeeze, um, get his legs in a good position to hold. Um, what I have to do is I have to start turning my hips in some way to make his body triangle less effective or to stop him from getting a body triangle altogether. So we're going to lock up. So I'm always pulling those hands down to my sternum away from my neck. And now pause right here, please. I'll take it back if there's a lag. Right here is good, actually. Yeah. Okay. So what you've noticed is that look at how I've done a good job of 
starting to misalign my hips to avoid the body triangle. Mm -hmm. When I notice an opening in his legs, what I'm going to try to do is jump my hips over Ricky's left leg. Mm -hmm. Okay. So by jumping my hips over his left leg, he no longer has my torso in between his legs. And therefore my lower body is halfway out. We always define the back position or back control in two sections. Okay. Two quadrants. You have lower back control, which refers to your left hip to your right hip. And that's typically controlled by his hooks or a body triangle. Right now I'm about to free my lower back. I'm about to free hip to hip because I'm going to jump over his hooks where he has no hooks. And that leaves him with only the second form of back control, which is shoulder to shoulder. And that's usually controlled by either double underhooks or a seatbelt grip. So when someone has total back control, they either have hooks in or body triangle that controls hip to hip. And they have upper back control, which is usually controlled by uh, double underhooks or a seatbelt grip. Right now, I'm about to free myself of lower back control. He doesn't control my hips if he doesn't have any hooks in. So I do a good job of freeing that first. So, I'll send it back so we can see. So you'll notice off the go, I'm misaligning my hips um, so that he can't lock a body triangle and eventually I jump over his bottom hook and he has no lower back control. He only has upper back control. So here yeah, I have yeah. over You're hiding it. the back away and rotating. And now I get my shoulder to the inside of his, which allows me to inside spin. Okay, stop. Okay, now. Uh, if you can go back just a little bit, Paul, to where like my back is still on the floor before he puts me in an arm lock. Here, maybe back a little bit more. I'll so I can send it to. Perfect. Oh, good. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit before, or a little bit after. No, right here. Right here is great. Okay. Okay. So now you're gonna see that I've done a good job of not only denying him lower back control, but denying him upper back control. Ricky doesn't control my lower back, okay? He doesn't control my hips because I've cleared both of his hooks. You'll see that he doesn't have a hook with either leg. He also mm -hmm. obviously doesn't have a body triangle. I've also cleared his upper body back control because I've unraveled his uh, seatbelt grip. I got my shoulders and head down to the mat where there's no longer a barrier between my shoulder blades and the floor. Okay. Normally that barrier would be his arms and chest, but I've uh, done an inside turn where I've spiraled out of it and unraveled it. The mistake I made is the position of my right hand. Notice where my right hand is right now. There. My, yeah. my right hand is doing, I don't know what the fuck it's doing, uh, but it wasn't in the right place. Where it should have been, can you go back to there. where it was? Uh, one second. Good, right here is fine. Yep, yeah. okay, one sec. I'll just send it. So we've got that spin, clean the bar. There. Yep. Yeah. Now where my right hand should have been was making a frame underneath Ricky's right arm and creating space. Mm -hmm. So even if I couldn't get my whole arm in there, I should have been digging my hand in there to make space so that I could safely bring my left elbow in front of his body. And once my elbow comes in front of his hips, he's no longer behind me. The elbow is always how we define if someone's behind you. If you think about it from standing position, from closed guard, from yeah. the front headlock, from any grappling position, if you get your chest behind somebody's elbow, you're behind them. My The last key to my escape is to get my left elbow to the floor in between me and Ricky. That has to be done by creating a little bit of space because he's still tight to me. Down into his hip, right? So you'd want your yeah. elbow on the floor next to it, in his pocket, 
essentially. Exactly. Yeah. And that should have been done by me making a frame with my right hand. Okay. I didn't do that because I'm a retard. And so what he does is he takes full advantage of it and uses to chain another attack and puts me in an arm bar. So this is a great example of how because you're missing one detail, and in this case, the most important detail, I went from being on the brink of escaping, and I would have been out in like 10 seconds and in really good position. I went on the I went from nearly being out completely to being put in a full blown fucking arm bar and now I gotta fight my way out of that. Yeah. So you keep the tape going. So because I don't wanna do things the right way, I afford him the ability to slip me into an arm bar. Now, pause it right here, please. <clears throat> Okay, now, when he puts me in the armbar, I immediately go to my defensive protocols. Protocol number one, get the fuck off your back, okay? You'll notice that I do a good job of getting to my knees. When I get to my knees, it's so much easier to deal with the position because I can stack his knees towards him and I can put weight on him uh, and look to control him from the top position. If Ricky returns me to my back, now I've got two problems. Problem number one is that he can separate my hands and break my arm in half. Problem number two is that I'm pinned. Okay, most people look at the Jujigatami position and they only see it as a submission hold. But yeah. the reality is, think about it. Well, when Gatami somebody, means control. You, yeah, when somebody's holding you in Jujigatami, it's a means of control, just like you said, it's a pin. And so now you got to deal with two problems at once. You got to deal with defending your arm and escaping a pin. So I do a good job of getting to my knees and I'm like, okay, he's got your arm, but you only have to deal with protecting your arm and freeing it rather than protecting your arm, freeing it and escaping this pin. So you'll see my right hand comes in to make a frame over the thigh and I use a lever. My, uh, my right hand is levered over my left hand to protect it and I can use that to pull my left elbow out. Mm -hmm. Essentially breaking his posture as well. So Correct. his spinal alignment. Trying to keep his knees to his chest where he can't extend his mm -hmm. hips. Taking to, the power out. There we go. And then you just fuck off, get out. <laughs> so I get the hand in, I pull out, and I'm like, Jesus Christ. I just kind of not got lucky. I don't want to say I got lucky, but man, like, I made it hard. I made life a little harder than it had to be, which is kind of my, uh, I guess, kind of my, my style of how I live sometimes okay so now we're linking up for for overtime uh, offense and obviously i'm going to choose the back now this was uh an overtime situation kind of unique it was one that i've never been in before in the sense that all i needed to do to win was hold on for 15 seconds mm -hmm. now in those 15 seconds 15 seconds to, to most athletes seems like People are like, oh, like I could fucking hold anybody for 15 seconds. But 15 seconds in grappling, especially when you're in overtime and you've already fought 10 minutes. Yeah. And like to this point, this is one of the better guys that I've ever faced. 15 seconds is a fucking eternity. So my initial thing is how do we negate movement as best as we can for the longest that we can? And the best way that I know how to do that is with a body triangle. So... My initial thing is to create some kind of tension before the whistle begins. Um, if you start in a neutral position before the ref says go and then try to control someone, it becomes a race. And mm -hmm. you don't want to have to rely on a race to win a match because if you are just delayed or if he's faster than you, you don't want to leave it up to that. So what I try to do is I try to cheat within the rules. And I do that by creating isometric tension both in my elbows Expanding my legs by uh, pulling my heels to my butt. And so this allows me to not stop Ricky from moving, but at least to slow him down. And it allows me to feel which way he's going to turn. So when the ref says go, it's actually not up to me which side I lock the body triangle on. It's up to him. The idea is that if I do a good enough job uh, preventatively of creating isometric tension, I can't stop him from turning his hips, but I can slow him down enough that I can be like, oh, I see where you're going, and I can now lock a body triangle in response. So we start. 
he does a good job of hustling off the whistle and he's gone and I lock a body triangle now right here we could pause it okay yeah, this is fine so right here uh, my my first thought at this point was holy fucking shit <laughs> this kid literally just stood up with me on his back like it like I was his kid's sister um and I was not expecting that. So what allowed me to stay in this position and ride in this position was, I, I believe, the position of my left foot. What Ricky wants to untangle this body triangle is to take it in three stages. The body triangle right now is most effective when it's locked over his right hip. Okay? It's slightly less effective if he can pull it to where my right foot is in between his legs. Yeah. And then it becomes the least effective if he can pull it across his body entirely and put it on his left hip. If he can pull it across and put it on his left hip, it's going to give him the space and real estate to turn his hips inside of mine. Because what we have what's called a shared spiral, where he's on the inside of me and he can turn his body inside of mine. So what I'm thinking is you got to hide your right foot. Under no circumstance can you let him take your right foot and drag it across his body because then he can start to hula hoop you off and start to shake you off. Now, this also creates an interesting dilemma between control and submission because as Ricky commits his right hand down to my right foot to drag it across, which is the right idea, what is he not protecting? The space is there for his neck, yeah. His neck. So you got to make a choice. You can keep your hands protecting your neck and I can't strangle you, but I can ride you. Or you can look to unravel the body triangle, in which case it'll make it harder for me to ride you if you succeed, but that comes at a cost, and that cost is your neck. So I go to what's called, what, what John teaches us as what's called a default strangle. A default strangle refers to any time that your training partner takes their hands away from their neck or opens their neck up. If they do either one of those things, you stop what you're doing, and without even thinking twice, you shoot an arm across their neck. Forget about all the fancy, you know, back take system that yeah. we know and, and use. Forget about trapping arms. Forget about all that shit. Just squeeze. If somebody opens their neck, just fucking strangle them. And you do that by shooting your thumb directly behind their neck and trying to get your elbow to the middle of their sternum. So now at this point, I'm like, okay. I still got to ride him for 15 seconds, but I also have a situation of a default strangle where I feel no defensive hands covering the neck. And so the way that my body is just trained because of the way that, you know, we go through these back attacks for years is just to shoot my right arm across. So if we advance a little forward. Good. Stop. Yeah. Okay, now, once my right arm is across, notice the position of my right elbow. If my right elbow was kind of up by Ricky's uh, right shoulder, that would have made it really hard to lock a figure of four. It would have yeah. been like one of these awkward-looking, weird naked strangles where you can't really fit your hands through. But I do a good job of getting my elbow more towards his sternum. And that gives me the ability now to lock a, a good deep figure four. And the last piece to this is going to be head position. Ricky wants to unravel my rear naked strangle by controlling my thumb, uh, by reaching back and, and peeling my thumb down. So what I have to do is I have to protect my thumb. Um, I can't allow him to access it and pull it down. So you're going to see me do two things here to finish. You're going to see me first cover my thumb with my chin. If my chin is covering my wrist and thumb, he can't access it with his hand. And then I put my head in position and I cover it with my head. Um, and I put the crown of my head to the crown of his head um, again so that he can't access my hands. And then I start this rotational finish um, to, to put the, the actual stranglehold on. So you're going to see my chin position, then watch my head position, and then watch the position of my elbows to finish the strangle. <laughs> So there's the chin position. Now there's the head position where my head is directly underneath his and, and that allows me to get the finish. Um, one thing that I'll say that, that gives 
me as, as well as like like most of our team a lot of confidence is that if we get to the back and get a submission fully locked in or even like you know locked in uh the understanding of what we call finishing mechanics or breaking mechanics gives us the confidence that regardless of who it is like if i get to a submission on on someone i'm very confident that i'll finish it whereas a lot of guys um you see them getting submissions all the time and it's like 50 50 like uh, am, am i gonna finish this leg lock am i gonna finish this arm lock but i always felt that um like the coaching program that john has put forth gave gave me a really good understanding of what actually makes a submission work or not work um a lot of people focus on 20 different details that are that really have no they make no fucking difference the reality is there's usually two details that do make a difference and so i'm not concerned with you know the 20 different ways that this guy likes to finish his his arm lock or this guy likes to finish his rear naked i'm only concerned with what are the two things that if i don't do those two things i know it's going to fail um because when you're under you know the stress of a competition you can't remember 20 things you can't remember all these little variations that this guy showed you and that guy showed you you can only remember two or three and those two or three should be make or break where if you do them the move is going to work and if you don't do them the move's not going to work anything other than that is just extra and, and we can worry about later so for me the two things that i know have to happen once i get my hands locked i have to protect my thumb okay i can do that with my chin or my hand or, or my head um, and i have to employ some kind of rotational finish uh, especially if his chin is inside um, if you don't do those two things you know we can we can stop the conversation right there because those are the two most essential things at least for this given situation and how it went amazing amazing so um if i just go he get, he taps you get up and you got uncle hinarch there i like i like my favorite part is at the end they're drinking road sodas here the guys are just slamming bud light um, <laughs> and it made it, it made it for like a fun environment man it was kind of like uh i had never seen that at a grappling tournament you know the guys were just tossing them back i thought that was awesome Awesome. Yeah. So, um, thank you for that. That was insanely, insanely detailed, which is part of the, the reason for the channel. Um, have you got any sponsors or anyone that you want to... I know that you've got a cool... Was that a future kimono um, jacket I saw you put on? Oh, yeah. That's uh, super cool. Yeah, they make really cool stuff, man. Uh, I love the guys from Future and, and uh, everything they do for me. Super appreciative. Um but yeah, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully this whole you know COVID nineteen situation eases up soon, and you know the competitions continue, and yeah. I, I look forward to like getting back out there and 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 getting back after it. Like watching a match like this, especially that was uh, against such a tough guy, it makes me really miss um, yeah. you know the tough matches, the ones that you know don't come easy. Um, and, uh, you know, I just hope I'm back out there soon. I remember seeing at the start of um, the lockdowns and things like that, you were doing virtual privates. Is that still something that you're doing? Yeah, I'm doing uh, I'm, I'm doing a few virtual privates a week, which have been going really well. Um, and the virtual privates have been, you know, slightly different. So I have some that I'm doing with, with some athletes that are competitors uh, and they want to, you know, sometimes look at competition footage which we break down or they want specific strategies or, or just questions about how i prepare for competition and we go over stuff like that um and then some people are not competitors you know some people are you know just have everyday jobs and they just want to continue uh learning you know the techniques that they were before the lockdown and you know we go over um stuff like that so you know i would say like whether you're looking to break down film whether you're you have a partner and you you know uh, i've you know done privates where like they have a partner and i'm running them through drills um or even just talk about and go through specific kind of training uh geared for competition you know i've, I've done 
pretty much all of it in, in the last couple months. And, uh, you know, it's been going really well. So, and how do help. people get in contact with you about that? Uh, the best way is probably just through Instagram to shoot me a DM. Um, okay. And, uh, and I'll, I'll get back to you and we can, you know, talk specifics about time and, you know, pricing and stuff like that. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Well, I'll link to your Insta in the description of the video. Um, it's Saturday afternoon. I'm hoping actually to get this done this afternoon so I can, uh, I can stick it out. I will put, um, I'll put everything up for you. And just while I'm on the video, actually, um, so let me go to the, uh, just because we, I obviously got permission from on it for this. And I just want to say thanks to, was it Ed? Craig Andrew. And it was Curtis Andrew. Hembroff, yeah. Uh, and uh, th those those two uh, really like you know put a lot of work into the audit invitational. Uh, Priscilla as well. And uh, yeah, they took such good care of me like all three times I was out in Texas. So um, they're the best, and uh, you know I appreciate everything they did as well. Yeah. So thanks to Andrew for giving me uh, permission to use it. Um, right. Frank, I'm going to let you go to your day because it's what about about it's midday about, with you now? Yeah, about midday, lunchtime. Yeah, I gotta caffeinate my body some more and then go train. Of course, so. of course. Um, right. So I will. I'll keep in touch. I'll let you know when this is out. And thanks again, man. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Okay. See you soon. Be well, buddy. Bye. Bye.